It's been three days. I can still see the pain, the strain, the blood that drained that day at Calvary. They pierced his hands, his feet, for all to see this man, this king, this Jesus. This tangible passion, this relentless abandon, this love, this hope was gone. But Jesus wasn't finished yet. Today, today the stone's been rolled away. The grave has lost its claim of victory. Death has given way to life, to grace. Our sin replaced, erased by mercy. Hope is alive, mercy can thrive, revive, bring to life the hearts of men. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Amen. All right. Good morning, everybody. Hey, happy Easter. Welcome to the NAS. So great that we can celebrate uh, the resurrection today together. Uh, my name is Clay, and I serve as the lead pastor here at the NAS. If you are a guest with us, thank you so much for being a part of our Sunday morning service. It is just, it's a privilege and an honor uh, to host you this morning. And if you're watching live or a little bit later on, uh, thanks for being a part of our service as well. You guys look amazing. Um, and I was, I was actually sitting back here during the last song. You guys sound amazing too, man. Way to go. Um, yeah, giving yourself a round of applause. All right, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, uh, just uh, right off the bat, uh, two things real quick, actually. First, uh, today, just a quick heads up for those of you who call in as your church home. Today is Dollar Club Sunday. Dollar Club Sunday is where we ask everybody who attends the NAS to just give one extra dollar that goes out to the community. Um, in the back behind these two double doors is just a clear box. On your way out, if you would just drop a dollar in that box, everything that comes in today goes to health resources here in town that helps restock all of their supplies for young moms that come looking for diapers or formula or clothing, those types of things. And we're just partnering with them um, along with some area churches to help restock every Everything. So if you think of it on your way out, uh, drop a dollar in the box. All of that will go to them. Uh, second, this is just my heart. This is not going to come as a surprise to anybody. I'm just going to put my agenda out there uh, right away and right off the bat. My heart's desire uh, today, if you don't consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus, uh, skeptical, just searching, whatever, my heart's desire for you is that today... As the scriptures say, today would be the day of salvation for you, that you would come to know Jesus. And, and, you know, you might just say to be a Christian. Well, yes, but Jesus says this is eternal life, that you would know the Father and the one whom he has sent. And that is our heart's desire for you. And those of us who are here at the Naz, I pray... I mean, we know what that's like. We know the life change that Jesus brings. This is why we gather here. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so if, if you are a follower of Jesus, my, my prayer for you is that, man, the Holy Spirit would just strengthen your faith, and this would just be a day of rejoicing. This would be a day of joy and thanksgiving for you. Um, but I'm just really excited about what he has to say to us through his word. So before we jump into the message, let's say a quick word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, uh, our prayer comes 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And he's given us new birth into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And this inheritance is kept in heaven for us, who through faith we are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Jesus, what, a, what an amazing promise that we have through your resurrection. And so, God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts through your word. Holy Spirit, we just give you permission to speak to us. 
And Lord, would we see you more clearly, follow you more closely, and, and love you more dearly as a result of your word and you speaking to us today. We pray all these things, Jesus, in your name. And everybody said, amen, amen. So we are here to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. So here's, here's the question. How are the events of this one weekend, you know, from 2,000 years ago, how is that relevant to our lives today? What difference does this make in our lives? Well, to answer that question, we need to go on a bit of a journey, a bit of a journey with the disciples through that very weekend. As many of us know, the disciples had walked with Jesus for about three years. He'd called them to be his followers, to be his disciples, and they had witnessed Jesus do amazing things. They'd witnessed him do the impossible. They'd seen him you know, perform miracles, heal the crippled, heal the lame, heal the blind. They'd seen him, <clears throat> excuse me, calm the storms. They'd seen him cast out demons. They'd seen him multiply, you know, the, the loaves and the fish to feed tens of thousands of people. In fact, on their way to Jerusalem in this Passover weekend, they had just witnessed Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. And they had watched the crowds gather and amass and, and people are excited for about who Jesus is and, and what they think he's come to do. And on that you know, Sunday, what we know as Palm Sunday, Jesus enters into Jerusalem and he is hailed as the next king, the next king of the Jews. And the disciples are excited about this. They're going to rise to power. They're finally going to kick out Rome and the, the, the land of Israel, the nation of, uh, of Israel, the people of God are going to have their kingdom restored like it was in the time of King David. Jesus enters into Jerusalem, hailed as king, but throughout that week, because he was hailed as king, that did not set well with the Jewish religious leaders and several of the Roman authorities. And it's throughout that week that Jesus continues to teach that the religious leaders plot to take Jesus' life. The disciples are completely unaware of this. And on Thursday, Jesus asks his disciples to prepare the Passover meal. They meet in an upper room and they share this meal together. And in the course of that meal, Jesus shares something with them that shocks and stuns every single one of them. And he says, one of you will betray me. And they don't under, really understand who it is. Judas leaves, but they don't really seem to think anything about it. As the meal concludes, Jesus leads them to the garden, the Garden of Gethsemane as we know it, where he asks his disciples to stay awake and pray. Jesus asks them to stay here as he goes on, and, and he begins to pray to the Father in heaven, Lord, if it is possible, would you please take this cup from me? Jesus' hour had come. He knew where the next several hours was leading. And yet he prayed, but not my will, but your will be done. Jesus checks on his disciples. He finds them fast asleep. He wakes them up. Please pray. That, that I just need you to pray. Can you not stay awake for five minutes and pray with me? They've never seen him so distressed before. Jesus goes back and prays the same prayer, comes back, checks on them again, still asleep, wakes them up. The process continues. And then Judas arrives, but he's not alone. In fact, he has with him some men with clubs and swords. And Judas walks up to Jesus and kisses him on the cheek. And that was the sign. That was the one who these men were to arrest. And as they move to Jesus, a fight breaks out. The disciples stand up for him. Peter grabs a sword, lops off a soldier's ear. Like that escalated quickly. And it just a, a, big, a big mayhem. It just mayhem ensues. The men grab Jesus, seize him, arrest him, and take him away. The remaining disciples run and flee for their lives in the middle of the night. Throughout the night, Thursday night and into Friday morning, Jesus is brought before both Jewish officials and Roman officials, and he's falsely, falsely accused illegally tried. Throughout the night and throughout the trials, he's beaten, spat on, mocked. His body is brutalized. 
By Friday morning, he's sentenced to flogging, 39 lashes with the whip, and then death on a Roman cross. And at 9 a.m. Friday morning, Jesus is laid out on a wooden cross. His arms are extended and two spikes, one in each wrist, driven through to secure him to the cross beam. His feet are put together and a spike driven through his feet to secure him to the vertical beam. And then he's hoisted up And the cross drops into place for everyone to see. And for six hours, Jesus will press up against the nails to just catch a breath. But the pain of the nails forces him to come back down in which he loses breath. It's a six-hour battle in which he will ultimately suffocate and die. And at 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon, Jesus breathes his last. Jesus, the disciples' best friend, their king, their Messiah, is dead. His body is taken down off the cross. Most times, those bodies were just thrown on a heap to rot or perhaps to burn. But two men secure Jesus' body, and they hurriedly wrap his body with linens and spices. They have to get his body prepared for burial before sundown. They place him in a tomb, which is then sealed and guarded by two Roman soldiers. The tomb now becomes property of Rome. And it's over. It's done. Jesus is dead. Messiahs don't die. Messiahs aren't supposed to be buried. I mean, in the course of of 24 hours, the disciples' high hopes and their enthusiasm and their excitement, their world just gets turned upside down. It's all turned to shock and heartbreak, despair, fear, hopelessness. And in fact, this whole thing, His death just undermined everything that he taught about himself. Everything that he said he came to do means nothing. It's over. And I'm sure throughout Friday night and all through Saturday, they asked all kinds of questions. How, how, did, how did this happen? We had the crowds. We had momentum. How, how, did, how did Jesus allow himself to be betrayed and arrested and even ultimately crucified. Like, how, how did the world win out over God? How, how did evil win out over good? Like, how, how do we even know what's true anymore? What, what, is, what has the last three years even been about? What do we do now? Where do we go? How, how, how does this play out from here? See, on that Friday... Everyone unfollowed Jesus. When Jesus died, their hope died with him. It's done. And see, Easter is completely relevant to our lives because it addresses the deepest realities that we are confronted with in our lives. So let me ask the question, at what point in your life Did your hope fade or die? At what point in your life did you, maybe life got shifted, your world got turned upside down, and hope faded and died? Oftentimes it comes during loss in our life, perhaps the loss of a spouse, an unborn child that we'd been expecting, Maybe the loss of a parent or a sibling even. Maybe it's, maybe it's the, a, a shift in direction. You thought your life was going one way. You thought education was going one way. Career was going one way. And then it went another. 
and you lost what you thought might be. Perhaps it's, it's the loss of a marriage, loss of trust in a vital relationship in your life, a loss of what you thought was good character in your own life, perhaps the loss of innocence, loss of health. And isn't it true that in those moments, in those times, we asked a lot of the same questions that the disciples asked? How did this happen? Where is God in all of this? How, how, does, it, how does it work that the world won out over what I thought was God's will? Like, wh where do we go from here? I'm not even sure what's true anymore. How, how, does, how does the rest of this all play out? And maybe in those moments, when hope faded and died, maybe you unfollowed Jesus too. Maybe that's you today, and if, if you have or if you feel tempted to unfollow Jesus in light of those questions, in light of losing hope, I, I guess I have a, a couple questions for you. In, in, in unfollowing Jesus, where does that leave you? What, what ha and and, I, and I'm, I'm asking legitimately, what has that solved for you? What, what, what's left? Like, what is out there in the world that's worth placing your hope in? Because we know, as we've uh, observed our world, observed our culture over these last three or four years, like, that's revealed some things. Like, it's revealed that so many of the things that the world offers and pursues and substitutes for hope actually leaves us more hopeless and more empty. Things and people and institutions we thought we could once trust, we no longer can. Right there, there, there is so little, if we are completely honest, so little in our world that anchors us in the instability and uncertainty of our lives. I mean, don't, if we're honest, we feel that, right? We feel the weight of that. As adults, like that, that's a burden to us. Younger generations, are buried underneath of that. They carry the weight of that. It, it honestly reminds me of the lyrics from the song, Death Was Arrested. And this might resonate with you, alone in my sorrow and dead in my shame, lost without hope and no place to begin. Like there's a missing piece in my soul. There's a void in my soul. And see what what we have to understand, and some things we know about hope, is that created in God's image, we're hardwired for hope. That, that's the thumbprint of God on your life. We, we are always looking for hope. We are always attaching the hope of our heart to something or someone. And don't we all know, we would all recognize that for hope, this confident expectation, not wishful thinking, but this confident expectation for hope to be reliable and trustworthy, it has to address what's broken in life. Otherwise, why hope in it? It has to resolve or it has to um, reconcile the, the biggest, deepest, darkest dilemmas of our life or it's not worth hoping in. But here's what we also have to understand about hope. That oftentimes the doorway to hope is actually hopelessness. The doorway to hope is when we're in those places of asking questions. Does God see me? Does God hear me? Does he care? Does he move in my direction? Where is God in all of this? And that's exactly where we find the disciples. That's where we find all of the followers of Jesus on that weekend 2,000 years ago, on that Friday when Jesus' body lay in the tomb, dead, along with all of their hopes in him, gone. So how does Easter address the deepest and darkest realities of our life. Well, the disciple John 
tells us. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 1. The author, obviously, is, is the, uh, the disciple John. He was one of the first men to follow Jesus, to be called by Jesus. He was in Jesus' inner circle. And he writes the events of the Sunday following Jesus' crucifixion. And he says, early on the first day of the week, on Sunday, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went from the tomb. Now, Mary Magdalene had been radically transformed by Jesus and had followed him uh, from that day on. But I love the way John writes, because he, he writes in such a way, his gospel is so unique. He, he writes with this imagery, the literal and, and figurative. He's using that that style of writing. He says, well, it's still dark. Yes, it's physically dark. It's in the morning. Sun hasn't come up yet, but it's also emotionally and spiritually dark, saying that she and the disciples are still reeling inside. They're still lost. They're still afraid, still devastated, still confused, still searching, still hopeless. Now, here's the question. Why did she go to the tomb? Two reasons. One, was to re-embalm Jesus' body. She, like any good woman, always cleans up after the men. It was a rush job. They didn't get it right. She's <laughs> got to go and fix the whole thing. We acknowledge it. She's got to re-embalm Jesus' body. Why else does she go to the tomb? Because she expected... Jesus to do what dead people normally do, remain dead. See, some people will say that the gospel writers made up the resurrection story. But when you read their account and how it actually went, it actually gives a lot of credibility to the reality of what they're saying. She, if Rome knew how to do one thing, it was kill people. They had perfected the art of crucifixion. Only one person ever came back from being crucified. They expected him to be dead. Goes on. And she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Verse 2, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. Think John thinks a little highly of himself. All right. And said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Like, it has just gone from bad to worse. But listen, uh, and, well, and, and Peter, we're told, Peter and John run to the tomb. They look inside. They see the, the, the linens lying there. And what is their assumption? What is her assumption? Someone has stolen the body. Even John writes of himself in verse 9, after Peter and John run into the tomb, verse 9, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Nobody there expected Jesus to be alive. That was not their thing. See, this, this kind of account actually lends credibility to, their, to what they wrote because they're honest about themselves as doubters. They write them in they write themselves in as skeptics. We didn't believe it. We didn't see it coming. See, if, if they sat down and made this whole thing up, right, how would they have written themselves in? They'd have been the heroes. Oh, Friday, that did not even phase us. We knew that was coming. You know, that whole running thing, that was just for show. Right, Saturday, we got some Jersey mics, watch some football. <laughs> not even phased, because we knew what was happening. You know, and, and so Sunday morning rolled around. We got everybody together. We stood outside the tomb. Okay, guys, let's start the countdown. 10, 9, 8, cue the sunrise, 7, 6, angels, 5, 4, hallelujah, chorus, get ready. None of that. As one pastor says, nobody got to the tomb. Nobody expected to find no body. They were completely blown away by this. They did not expect it. And Peter and John, it says they returned back to the city where they were staying. And like good gentlemen, they just left Mary in the, at the tomb distraught crying. Way to go, guys. 
Verse 14 says this. She turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Again, not expecting a resurrection. Verse 15, Jesus asks her two questions. And the first question, every husband has asked his wife. Woman, why are you crying? <laughs> first service didn't find that funny at all. I'm glad that you guys... <laughs> We're jiving here. This is good. <laughs> Second, who is it you're looking for? Let me ask you a question. In your life, when you consider all of the things that you're doing and the choices that you make, what are you looking for? Acceptance, income, pleasure, power, authority. What are you looking for? And what are you chasing to find those things? What are you chasing to find those things? See, I love the, the question that's asked in Luke's account. It was in our video, Luke 24, verse 5. Why do you look for the living among the dead? See, I love that question. It's almost as, you could, as if you could say, listen, why are you seeking life in and attaching your heart to the cold, tainted, empty, dead things of this world in hopes to find life? Why are you looking there to find the hope of your heart? And see, here's, here's what's counterintuitive to us when it comes to the Lord. See, in His grace, our Heavenly Father will allow us to chase all of those things. He will allow us to pursue all of those things, to try to fill that void in our hearts, to, to, to fill that missing piece in our hearts. He'll allow us to chase all of the things of the world, booze and money and beauty and substances and power and achievement and sexuality. He'll allow us to, to fully chase after those things until it finally catches up with us. We spin out of control, crash, and hit bottom. He will allow us in his grace to do that. Why? Because he knows that the doorway to hope is hopelessness. See, he will allow you and I to see how hopeless all of those things really are because it points to him as the only true source of hope and fulfillment in our life. He will allow you to come to a place of hopelessness to realize your only hope is in him. Why do you look for the living among the dead? See, Jesus, Jesus just cuts right to the heart and asks the better question. No, who is it? Who are you looking for? See, Jesus changes the question because he knows that the, 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 the missing piece of your soul is not going to be found and filled in some defunct thing in the world. It's only going to be found and filled by the divine person of Jesus Christ himself. Who is your heart searching for? As Augustine, St. Augustine once wrote, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests only in you. In other words, the only way to find hope, this confident expectation in life, is to abandon all of the things that you attach your heart to in this world. Abandon all of your hope in them and attach the hope of your heart to him. It's to turn fully to him. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 9, For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate, and when you turn to him, he will not turn his face from you if you return to him. Not if you return to a church building. He's not saying that. That's a good thing, but that's not what he's saying. If you will return to listening to Christian podcasts, that's a good thing, but that's not what he's talking about. If you will return to a rite and a ritual, it's a good thing, but it's not what he's talking about. If you will turn to him, him, 
Who are you looking for? Where is your hope placed and set? John goes on in verse 15. Mary, thinking he was the gardener, still not prepared for this, said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus, verse 16, said to her, and I love this, Mary. Mary. And see, what I love about this is even when you don't recognize Jesus, when you don't realize how close he really is to you, he calls you by name. He knows you. He knows your name. He knows your life. He knows everything about you. And he calls you to himself. He calls you out of sin, out of the darkness, out of despair, out of fear, and into the light and life of his presence. And it's in that moment, she recognizes that it's him. And he tells her, run back to Peter and John. Go tell the disciples of everything you've seen. And she does. And when she arrives, she cries out, verse 18, I've just seen the Lord. He's alive. And because Jesus is alive, everything about everything changes in life. Everything changes. And that's true for us today. See, the, the resurrection of Jesus is the single most important event in history, and it should cause every single one of us to entirely rethink our lives. That the Easter, Easter and the resurrection arrives, this is the whole story, in the context of people's darkness and hopelessness and offers them eternal and everyday hope in the risen King Jesus. He is alive. The, the, it just reminds me of the... I'm going to get emotional reading this. I already know it. The lyrics to the song Living Hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. And if you don't know, Christianity is all in on the resurrection. All cards on the table, it's all in. And, and, and you know, how do I say this? Christianity, like we don't even hide this because we know you find the body, the whole thing falls apart. And we don't hide that. We are aware of that. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote this, 1 Corinthians 15. He acknowledged this. Listen, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. If Christ hasn't been raised, our preaching is useless. He's saying, listen, if that didn't happen, then we made all of this up. It's a big sham. Don't listen to us anymore. And we are ultimately going to die for nothing. And he says, not only is our preaching useless, but your faith, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, your faith is useless. You are good for nothing. You're behaving a certain way for nothing. If he didn't raise, there's no redemption, there's no forgiveness of sin, there's no life after death. Tear out everything in your Bibles. Don't pray, don't go to church, don't go to Bible study, don't sing worship songs because it's all meaningless. If Jesus didn't raise, let's go home. But he says in verse 20, but indeed... Jesus has been raised from the dead, and he appeared to over 500 witnesses over the course of 40 days, and their whole thing, the whole reason why they wrote and why they included the people that they did was like, you don't believe us? Go ask them. They witnessed it too. This is verifiable, and, and here's, here's the reality of the New Testament. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, well, let me back up. There's not one page of the New Testament that's written apart from the conviction that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. 
If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, we don't have a New Testament. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, we wouldn't even know there was a Jesus of Nazareth in the first century in the first place. No-name guy who got killed by Rome with all thousands of the others. That's how important the resurrection is. That The reality is that we serve a risen king. We serve the risen Christ. And because he's risen, this is what Mary understood, you can have an eternal hope when the things of life fall apart, when, the, when your world gets turned upside down in the darkest moments because he has overcome the world, overcome sin, overcome Satan, overcome death. He has the final say, nothing else does. Let me illustrate it this way. In 1831, a German painter by the name of Moritz Retsch finished his artwork called Checkmate. You might be familiar with this, may not be, but in this portrait, in this picture, is a chess game between Satan on the left and a young man on the right. And if Satan wins, then he claims the right to the young man's soul. And it's called Checkmate because Satan has the man's king in checkmate, trapped. There's no move that this young man can make that will not end in his defeat, hence the look of despair. The story goes that about 50 years later, in the late 1800s, an American chess player by the name of Charles Morphy was invited to come see this painting. And upon seeing it, he was captivated by it. And he spent hours studying this portrait, studying this picture, scrutinizing every detail. And after several hours of looking at this painting, he comes to the realization, the game's not over. L looking, at the puzzle pe or looking at the pieces on the board, he actually says there's one more move that this young man can make, and it actually swings the game back into his favor. And he has said, it is reported that he has said this. This was his statement. The king has one more move. The king has one more move. That's the promise in your life in the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the midst of the darkness and the hopelessness that you find yourself in in life. That because he is risen, there is always one more move. There's always one more move in your life, in your sin, in your illness, in your broken marriage, in your broken relationships with your kids, in your character, in your loss, in your grief, and in your shame. They don't have the final say. Even if you find yourself on your deathbed, in Christ, the king has one more move, and that's eternity with him forever. That's the ultimate win. The king always has one more move. Because Jesus is risen, nothing is impossible. He is the God who can and specializes in bringing that which was dead into newness of life in him. Do not give up hope in this life. And it's like John wants to say to us, you can hope for something in this world. You can chase all of those things. Or you can hope in the one who died and rose again to redeem you and the entire world. What's it going to be? What's it going to be? And see, this is, this is how this plays out in our life. There's a, a family in our church that I truly just admire and I admire them because of their faith and knowing what they've walked through, the heartache and heartbreak and loss that they've experienced. And the wife posted something on Facebook a week or two back. And when I read that and considered their life, I, I, was, I was just moved because what she said and what she posted captured what we're talking about. 
And the essence of her post said that the good news of Easter is that because Jesus' story didn't end in darkness, in him, ours does not end in darkness either. And then she quoted this author. Jillian Benefield says, as we walk through the painful parts of our lives, we move forward knowing that new life will one day come. Redemption is not just a promise of the life after. It is available to us here and now. The little deaths that we experience in this life are to be redeemed in Christ. Not necessarily with tidy endings, but eventually where God fills in the dark spaces and breathes in new beginnings. Is there a dark space that God needs to fill in your heart and soul today? Is there a dead place where he needs to breathe in new beginnings? See, he meets us in the reality of our brokenness and our desperation and our hopelessness. And what we know, if if you've walked with Christ for any amount of time, but especially 10, 20 years for for the majority of your life, you've come to the understanding and you know that the only thing that gives you hope, the only thing that's going to last, the only thing that's going to give you the strength to stand when times and life is at its darkest is not some philosophy, it's not some girl, it's not some relationship, it's not some income, it's not a religion, it's not a politician, it's Jesus alone. The risen king of kings, it's in him we have hope. We're not gonna escape the the troubles of this world, he says, In this world, you're going to have trouble. It's going to be dark. It's going to be painful. But he says, take heart. (laughs) Have hope because I've overcome the world. Mark Clark, Pastor Mark Clark writes this. This is what I love. Jesus was not just a man resurrected 2,000 years ago. He is the resurrected Lord and ascended king. He was a 33-year-old poor Jewish peasant two millennia ago, but he is not that today. No longer is he a victim of earth and torture as he was on that Friday on the cross, but he is now the victorious and risen king. And that reality that Jesus is alive right now, today, demands a response from every single person. As John said in verse 16, Mary's response to Jesus calling her name, Mary turned toward him. We can turn to Jesus, receive him and walk with him, or we can turn away from him and reject him. Those are the only two options we have. There is no middle ground. And those are not my words, those are his. Have you in your life turned toward him? Because he comes along and he says, listen, the biggest problem is not outside of you, your biggest problem is inside of you. It's sin that has broken and damaged you and creates that vacuum in your heart. And when he hung on that cross for six hours, with his final breath, he cried out, it is finished. I have paid your penalty for sin because you cannot. And when you put your faith in your life, it puts your faith and trust in me and what I've done for you, I remove your sin as far as the east from the west. And he bore the full weight and punishment of God's wrath for sin, your sin and mine, so that we would not have to if we would trust him. That's how much he loves you. And that is so important because as we say around here a lot, Everyone spends eternity somewhere. And Jesus is clear. If you leave this, if you receive him in this world and you walk with him, when your time is up in this world, you will walk with him in and for eternity. But if you reject him and live your life apart from him in this world, when your time is up, you will continue to be apart from him for eternity. Have you turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
who's overcome sin and overcome death. And if you are one who has not done that, three very simple things. He says, repent of your sin, turn from your sin, and return to him. And he says, receive my salvation as a gift, not because of anything you've done. We do nothing. We bring nothing to the table in salvation. He does it all himself. He said, would you receive my salvation as a gift? And would you let my blood wash that stain of sin, cleanse you whole, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, that you'd be seen as perfect and holy and righteous in God's eyes. And then from there on out, we rely on him, trust in him to live a life that is holy, to live a life that honors and pleases him. And for those of us who are followers of Christ in light of his death and his resurrection, today's the day we just rejoice. Today is the day we say thank you. And today's the day we worship him for who he is and what he's done. And I'll close with this. Because Jesus is alive, today he is risen and he is reigning as king and one day he is returning soon. He is returning. Are you ready? Are you ready? And he's reigning. He has everything under control, complete control of the universe, and crazy enough, complete control of our nation. He's bringing God's purposes to completion. And listen, when he returns, he will judge the living and the dead. And those who have placed their faith and trust in him, who walk with him, who know that they are his, they will spend eternity with him forever. He will make all things new. We will be in a new heavens and a new earth. We will be in his presence forever. No more death, tear, crying, shame, none of that, all gone forever. As Peter said, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Where this morning and in whom does your hope lie? Let's pray together. Oh Lord Jesus, what a, huh. what great love you have for us. That you would pay for our sin and you would rise from the dead, rise from the grave. And he would offer us new and eternal life. And Lord, maybe for some of us, we are in that season where we have unfollowed you because of where life has turned, because of the loss we are experiencing. And we've searched the things of the world and we've, we've come up empty, we come up hopeless. But Jesus, I pray that there would be that those that have unfollowed you would turn today and follow you. They would confess their sins, repent, turn of, of their ways, and return to your grace and your mercy. God, I pray for those that today would be honest enough to say I'm spiritually unresolved, been a bit skeptical, but they know, Lord, that you've been speaking to their hearts. And maybe today, Lord Jesus, is the day of salvation. Today is that day where they lay down all of their sin, they lay down all of their pride, lay down all of their life, and they fully surrender and give a full yes to you, Jesus. And Lord, those of us who know you and love you, we just want to take the time in this song to just worship you. We are not worthy. through your son you've made us worthy and we just want to praise you and thank you for the life change that you've given us what you've done in our lives we are hopeless and helpless without you and so god in, in these moments in this last song if we need to if we need to surrender our life to you if we need to say yes to you begin a brand new life with you god would you give us the courage and the grace to say yes God, if it's just to say thank you, God, would we worship with all of our heart and soul and our voice and our strength? God, you are so worthy. And God, for those of us that are just hurting and hopeless, God, would you come in and touch and heal 
and restore to them the joy of your salvation. Give them that confident expectation that the king has one more move. The king has one more move. So Jesus, move in us as we worship you in this closing song. We love you. We pray all these things in your name. And everybody said, amen. Let's stand and worship him together.